Welcome to Crisis and Hope, Why You Voices. Crisis and Hope is a project of the Center for Israel Studies, the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Program for International Affairs, the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies and Judaic Studies at YU, Mada'e Hayahadut. My name is Ronnie Pirellis. I'm a professor of Jewish history and the director of the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Center for International Affairs at Yeshiva University. Today, we welcome you to Resistance and Memory, Jewish Activism During Argentina's Dirty War. Uh, and it's a, a real honor for me to introduce and to welcome uh, Dr. Natasha Zaretsky. Um, and this topic, this comes at the end of our series on Jewish Latin America. Um, it's been a series that has gone from everything from colonial times where we discussed slavery, we discussed the figure of Esther, as a, as a heroine among the crypto Jews and the conversos in the Atlantic world. Um, then we moved on to the modern period. We've seen, we did a tour of a historic synagogue in Mexico City. Um, we've discussed everything you know, under the sun. Um, and I'm really excited that we have this opportunity uh, to look backwards, but also to think about memory. Memory is not the same thing as history. Although this is a history class, uh, memory is uh, something is an activity that we do to reconnect things which are broken, things which are not, and, and, and which, are, which are disjointed. Um, we use history to uncover, we use history to understand um, and to piece together though that past, but memory is an active um, force and it's something which is deep, deep in Jewish culture. Uh, zechira, to remember and remembrance is an essential part of, of, of what we find uh, the Torah in, in, in trusting us to do. Um, and so for that reason, I'm really excited that we could look at Argentina as a test case, um, a place with deep, deep Jewish culture, um, a, a complex society uh, that has gone through some really, really difficult violent periods. And, um, and I'm really excited for Natasha uh, my, uh, to be our guide and to um, open up, open up this, this, this chapter, which a lot of Americans really don't know very much about, uh, which is a real shame considering that we are tied to this. The United States government and United States foreign policy had a hand in many of these events. And as Jews who have a global consciousness, our fellow Jews in South America um, really had a very large role in outsized role um, in the events that, that, that Dr. Zaretsky is gonna be talking about. Please send in questions to the chat. Um, if it's something related directly to um, what, she, what she's talking about right at the moment, I, I, I may interrupt just so that um, we can we can get some clarification, but otherwise, please send in the questions to the chat. Your input is very important, and um, thank you so much for being here. I want to give a shout out uh, to my colleague William Stenhouse. Professor Stenhouse is here, uh, chair of the history department, and many of you have taken courses with him. And it's really a, a, a delight to see you. And uh, without any further ado, Dr. Natasha Zaretsky. Um, thank you so much, Professor Perlis, for that lovely introduction. Um, it, it, I first uh, met Professor Perlis through the Latin American Jewish Studies Association, uh, which is also a wonderful organization if you're ever interested in learning more about the experience of Jews in Latin America. Um, and I'd like to thank Professor Perlis for inviting me here, as well as the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Program for International Affairs, um, as well for hosting me. And um, I'll say that I'm a cultural anthropologist, so that's my own perspective, who works on memory in Argentina and in the Jewish diaspora more broadly. And I wanted to begin today by introducing my approach and perspective as a cultural anthropologist to give you a sense of where my own questions are coming from. Um, and I'll share my screen now. So just let me know if you can't see it. So just two seconds, okay. Um, so, oh, sorry. Started, okay, now uh, we're good. All right, okay. So, uh, so today I'll be talking about resistance and memory. And I will say that a lot of the themes that I'll be discussing stem from uh, my new book, which I'll just share the cover of here called Acts of Repair, Justice, Truth, and the Politics of Memory. 
in Argentina. And at the heart of my research was the question of how do individuals and communities survive periods of violence and collective trauma, and in the aftermath of that violence of trauma of genocide, as Professor Perales noted there, that sense of what it actually means for Jews in Argentina who have survived multiple periods of violence, how can they create personal and collective meaning again. Uh, these are the questions that take me into the themes of today, resistance and memory, and really thinking about what that means in the context of the Jewish community in Argentina and the time that is called the Dirty War, that used to be called the Dirty War, a period of dictatorship from 1976 to 1983, when up to an estimated 30,000 people were systematically killed, tortured, and disappeared um, by the military dictatorship in power um, because they viewed them as quote-unquote subversive or potentially subversive to their idea of national order. That period in Spanish used to be called the Proceso for process of national reorganization. And in more recent years, it's come to be understood as a genocide um, because of the government's attempt to destroy a population in part, which is part of the definition of genocide and the Genocide Convention. So today I'll be taking you through the history of those years of the dictatorship and the role of Jewish activism during that time, and also talk about why that continues to matter today for the Jewish community and for democracy in Argentina more broadly. Um, but I actually wanted to begin um, by showing you all a clip, um, a moment in time um, from more recently, from 2017. Um, and what you see here is an image, and I'm going to show some video as well, and I'll put the link to that in the chat so you can also see it in case there's there are any issues with, with the material. But who you see here is a woman in the white headscarf. Her name is Vera Haraj. Um, she was born in Milan, Italy, and she emigrated to Argentina as a child in 1939 to escape the rise of fascism and Nazism there. And you see her here in the year 2017, standing on the edge of the River Plate, um, which is a large body of water in Argentina that separates Argentina from Uruguay. And the importance of this space is that this body of water is also where the military in those years of dictatorship would take the bodies of people who they disappeared and throw them into this body of water to completely erase their existence. So this woman, Vera, um, her daughter, Franca, was killed in this way during those years. She was disappeared as a teenager when she was just 18 and then tortured and then thrown into this body of water where Vera now stands decades later in the year 2017. Um, to her right, you see Marcelo Brodsky, who's an important Jewish Argentine artist whose brother was disappeared. And to her left in this image, you see Angela Merkel, the German chancellor who was there visiting. Um, the reason I want to start off with this moment is because of what it tells us about why these cultures and politics of memory are so important to Argentina, not just to the past, but also to the present and the future and what the role of Jewish activists was during this time. And so I'm going to share this clip. And as I share it, I would love for, um, for you, if you have any thoughts to put them into the chat about what is actually standing out to you when you see this in terms of these intersections of history that are present. Um, so I'm just going to play this clip. Just It's just 50 seconds. And if you can, I'm just going to play a snippet now just to make sure the sound works. Yep. Yes. Years. 
Okay, so I'm just going to stop my share for a moment um, and ask if you have anything that stands out to you, you can put it in the chat. Um, and I'll just as you're doing that, also uh, share just some of the words from what Vera Haraj said in case that's easier to see. Um, so what Vera said was, I'm an Italian Jew. When I was 10 years old, the racial laws came into effect in Italy. My family survived. They came to Argentina, she and her parents. But my grandfather stayed, remained in Europe, and ended up in Auschwitz. And there is no grave for him. And then many years later, as she continued, my 18-year-old daughter was disappeared, detained, tortured in a concentration camp, and killed in a death flight, and there's no grave for her either. Um, so I, so I, I'm not sure if anyone has, um, okay, so, um, so I'm going to just if it's okay, invite anyone who has any thoughts to even share them now, and then I'll go back to talking about this history, just because I'd love to get a sense of what's standing out to you all here today in seeing this. Um, so if I may, um, Erica, you had a comment in the chat? Yes, hi, I'm sorry that my camera is not on, it's not working right now, so forgive me for that. But um, it just seems that, you know, she she just says it as a fact and she has no emotion to it and it's very sad like and and um this seems as if you know she's not the only one who's going through this she's not special in her trauma which is very very sad um, yeah, I think that sense of how she's one of many who have survived this, and this is the year 2017, um, four decades after her daughter was disappeared, and she continued to advocate week after week after week for this mm -hmm. with the group, the Mothers of the Plaza de Maja, and what it actually means for her um, to be telling her story in this way so many times. And of course, um, I think in my own research with survivors and family members of victims of these these periods of violence, thinking about what it means to publicly talk about their trauma, and then mm -hmm. what happens in private is sometimes really different in the way that they navigate it. So I think those are dynamics that are really important to think about. Thank you, um, Erica. Um, uh, we have some, some others who are also in the chat. Um, and um, let's see, um, Juliet, you had a comment here about the lack of a grave. Um, what stood out to you there? Well, it was kind of her last line when she was telling both of the accounts, like and she made it separate and really seemed to emphasize it. And I think she was trying just to like show how inhumane both of the like persecutions were. The lack of a grave and the lack of the ability to mourn and to have the kind of ritual that um, that she would have wanted to have and that her family would have wanted to have for the case of her grandfather as well as her daughter is something that's really important there. And I think also understanding the generational aspect of it that you know what I'm going to be talking about and sharing with you is something that happened in Argentina, um, but it's not separate from what was happening in Europe or other parts of the world as well well, um, but specifically in terms of how there are gen there are activists who themselves are survivors of the Holocaust or whose family was killed and then had their children or family members also killed during the period of the dictatorship. So what it means to be navigating these multiple layers of violence and trauma. And maybe I'll just ask Shira, who, uh, who talked about the comparison between Argentina and the situation in Europe, to just add a thought here before I'll move on. So Shira, you wrote something about the comparison between Argentina and Europe. Yeah, I found it surprising not really knowing the history of what you're going to be discussing about what happened in Argentina. Um, and I think there's such an emphasis um, on learning the Holocaust, which should be, um, but also just somebody who's never really learned about what happened in Argentina. The comparison was just so surprising. And I think it's also incumbent that we also learn about genocides, not just in Europe, but also in these other places too. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that, Shira, and for everyone who wrote into the chat and who commented. I'm going to continue now um, talking about uh, more of the history in Argentina to give you a sense of who the community is, how they came into being, and the way that they navigated these ongoing periods of violence through their activism. Um, so as I said, when I arrived in Argentina, my question had to do with how communities and individuals can survive and find meaning again after having having gone through periods of violence. And the reason why Argentina and Buenos Aires was so interesting for me was because of the multiple layers of violence there. Um, so you have a community, it's the largest Jewish community in Latin America, so it numbers about 200 to 250,000. It is the seventh largest community in the world. And because of that, you have a lot of history represented there. So um, the majority of the community emigrated in the late 1800s, early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, fleeing the pogroms um, and the violence in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, then you had another wave that came um, later um, in the 1930s when there was a rise of Nazism in Europe and then who emigrated as Holocaust survivors. Um, and so you have the impact of the Holocaust as well on the community in Argentina. And then you had the dictatorship from 1976 to 1983. Um, and then finally, more recently in 1994, there was a bombing that took place in Argentina, the AMIA bombing, which is considered um, the, one of the worst anti-Semitic terrorist attacks in the Western hemisphere. And it's still remains unsolved and in a state of impunity as of this writing, as of this today. Um, so you have these multiple periods of violence there. And so um, in thinking about how the community grappled with that, I'm going to start with these early years of the immigration. So um, as I said, this is the largest Jewish community in Latin America, um, but Jews have still been a minority there in Argentina. They represent about 1% of the total population. So it's not a very large community. And the first wave, as I said, came fleeing the pogroms and violence in Russia and Eastern Europe. And it's mostly an Ashkenazi community, although there's also a Sephardic community present. And um, in those early years, um, many of the Jews ended up going to agricultural colonies um, and learning how to farm. Um, and one of the most famous ones is called Moises Vige or Mosesville. Um, and this is where you have this phenomenon of what are called uh, Yiddish gauchos, like Yiddish speaking cowboys in Argentina. So this was part of this history in Argentina. Um, as I said, um, you know, while over, over the years, there were many people who survived um, different periods of violence, but I also just want to say this was a very vibrant community. There was a very active Yiddish press and Yiddish theater. Um, there were many religious organizations, schools, community groups. Um, so, you know, this, this was a community that was thriving in many, in many ways and continues to be thriving. Um, and yet, despite that, uh, the position of Jews in society remained unsettled, with many state policies unfavorable towards Jews, if not overtly anti-Semitic. And so while they did become part of the national fabric in many ways, rising to the middle class, establishing community organizations, schools, religious institutions, they also remained vulnerable to surges in anti-Semitism, which made them question their feeling of belonging in Argentina. And this only underscored why their activism during the, the so-called dirty war, during that period of dictatorship, why that was so important for them. Um, so in thinking about all of this before getting into that period of the dirty war, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the impact of the Holocaust on Argentina and thinking about what those first years after the war were really like for Jews in Argentina. Um, and to give you a sense of that, um, as I said, this is the largest Jewish community in Latin America. So of course you would have many survivors who would travel to Argentina after the war to be reunited with whatever family they may have left. Um, what's important to note about this period though is that there was actually a ban on Jewish immigration in those years. So those who did emigrate had to do so with falsified papers and documents. At the same time, Nazis were able to enter Argentina, um, most famously perhaps Adolf Eichmann. He was one of those Nazis that did find a home in Argentina and a refuge there. 
Um, so he lived there for years until his capture in 1961. And then he was taken to Jerusalem to stand trial. And this trial was obviously very important as a trial of a Nazi, of a perpetrator of genocide. Um, and this was a trial that was also chronicled by the philosopher Hannah Arendt, where she coined the term the banality of evil. And of course, this trial has a very important history and Holocaust history in general. But I also just want to emphasize how important it was to the history of Holocaust survivors and their testimony. Um, so the scholar Annette Weaviorka notes that it was this trial that brought in what she calls the era of the witness, because this was the first time that there was a publicly televised trial where Holocaust survivors were giving their testimonies and accounts of what was happening during that time. So um, this was really important for the public sphere and for people's awareness, and also for the kind of agency that Holocaust survivors could have in public life. Um, but that was in the 1960s. Um, in the 1950s, um, not just in Argentina, but throughout the world, many survivors struggled with silence, with the silence of society, with the silence of their own feelings in relation to what they wanted to or could talk about. Um, and of course, trauma is the backdrop for all of this, and it affects people really differently. Um, and I wanted to share with you the story of one woman um, who I worked with closely in Argentina to give you a sense of what those years in the 1950s were like in Argentina for a survivor. So I'll tell you this woman's story. Her name is Elsa Rosine. Um, Elsa was born in 1923 in a small town outside of Minsk in what is today Belarus, and her family emigrated to Belgium, so that's where she spent her childhood years. And during our interview, she told us about the details of her life, um, and what was interesting was how aware she was of what it meant to be different at that time, and what it meant to feel different because she was Jewish. And she remembered the years when the law started changing and there were more curtailments on the rights of Jews. And in our interview, she also talked about everything that she had lived through of um, what it was like living in hiding, of her experience in Birkenau, of what it meant to survive, of what those days were like right after the war ended. Um, and she ended up in Argentina in the end um, because of family who was there, um, but she still struggled with what it meant to find a way forward. And part of it had to do with that difference between Europe and Argentina, between being in Europe where everybody lived through the war in some way, um, and being in Argentina that suddenly felt really far away, just to speak to what Shira had also brought up about that comparison between the two. And this is um, an excerpt from my book. And you know what you see here is Elsa saying, in Europe, people knew about the camps. But when I arrived here in Argentina, hardly anyone knew anything, and no one wanted to know anything. I tell you that the people did not want to hear a lot. They would say, look, don't get upset. It already passed. Try to move on. And I would say, but you don't know what really happened. And so for Elsa, she felt that people didn't understand and could perhaps never really know what happened. I mean, it would always be something distant, something that they just heard on the news, something far from their experience. And this felt to her like a kind of silence and was only made worse by other experiences that she had in those first years in Argentina. And, you know, I'll just say that that theme of silence you know, as we talk about memory is really important to think about what it means to forget or to deny or to not remember and what it means for those who survive something like the Holocaust or something like the dirty war and the dictatorship. So um, I'll tell you, I'll share a moment that Elsa shared with me about what that felt like to her in Argentina. And, you know, she talks about going to the movies and there in the theater, they were showing a documentary about what happened in World War II and in the concentration camps. And she shared with me in an interview, leaving the theater after the documentary, people were saying, well, I don't know if that's all true. There has to be a lot of propaganda too. And then Elsa continued saying, I didn't say anything. These were people leaving the theater talking in the hall and they said, do you think this could be true? Um, and what they were asking was, do you think the Holocaust is true that it happened? And that's something that was possible in Argentina because of how far away it was from the realities, not to say that there wasn't denial in Europe as well, but it's something that she really felt in that moment. And so 
for Elsa, um, that idea of people questioning the truth of an experience that she had lived through personally and survived, that shocked her, she said. And for her, this mattered because it showed a society that had what she described to me as deaf ears, not engaged and letting horrendous things happen. And this theme of a society being silent or letting things happen and why you need to resist that is something that will come up as well in the experience during the dictatorship. And so what's interesting also, and I'll just note for you before moving on about Elsa's story is that she ended up joining a group of other survivors, and that's also part of my research in thinking about what these collective spaces of memory become um, and how important they become for the survivors of something like the Holocaust and why they matter, not just in terms of, you know, collective memory, but also in terms of their own personal sense of agency and what I call in my work, how this becomes an act of repair for them. So um, as Elsa continued to live her life in Argentina in the 1950s and the 1960s, we saw what happened with Eichmann being captured there. Um, but this also had consequences in Argentina itself where there were neo-Nazi groups. So when Eichmann was captured, um, in response, there was anti-Semitism as well and violence that was directed against Jews in Argentina, including a young Jewish student who was 19, Graciela Sirota, who was kidnapped by one of these groups and a swastika was carved into her body. And so this was just one of the cases, this happened in 1962, that was part of the response to the fact that Eichmann was captured. And so this is the context in which the Jewish community is living. As I said, you have schools, you have youth groups, like you have many organizations, a vibrant press, a vibrant theater, and yet you also have these ongoing moments of anti-Semitism that are happening and anti-Jewish violence. And in thinking about these intersecting tragedies of something like the Holocaust and the dictatorship, um, during those years, as I said, um, there were up to an estimated 30,000 people who were disappeared by the ruling junta. Um, who were in power, who came into power in 1976, and up to 12% of those who were targeted were Jewish. And remember that Jews represented about 1% of the population. Um, now, there are historians like Emmanuel Ka'an um, who argue that these people weren't targeted just because they were Jewish, but because Jews were represented in many of the other groups that were being targeted, um, such as psychologists and teachers and students, um, you see this large impact on the Jewish community. And then once they were detained and put into the concentration camps in Argentina, they were treated differently because they were Jewish. So that was chronicled in the Truth Commission report as well as by other accounts. So um, the way that the military would operate is that they would often kidnap people as they were leaving school or from their homes or wherever it might be, and then they would just quote unquote, disappear them, which means leave no trace of what happened to them so that there was no way to follow up. There was no procedure. There was no rule of law. This was all just a dictatorship operating in the way it saw fit to create their vision of order, which meant disappearing anyone they thought was subversive to their idea of a Western Christian civilization. So they would kidnap people, they would torture them. Um, and if you were a woman and you had you were pregnant and gave birth while you were in one of these camps they would also take these babies and give them to military families and then those babies would live under assumed names and there's an organization called the grandmothers of the plaza de majo whose job is to reunite with their biological grandchildren um, and they have been able to recover over a hundred such grandchildren in this way over these last 40 plus years. So, um, so that just gives you a sense of the scope and impact so of, of this period. And this was a time, as you can imagine, of profound fear. Um, what you see here is what this place looks like now, which is the border of the River Plate, where we also saw Vera Harach, and this is the Park of Memory, and what you see is this image of a plane with a person in it that speaks to the death flights that used to happen there, and that's one of the challenges of Argentina is you're walking around these spaces in Buenos Aires, it's a very cosmopolitan city, and then to know that right there this horror was happening. Um, and so what do you do as a society with that? How do you stand up to that, especially in the years of extreme terror and fear that something would happen to you?
So that takes me into the activism that did take place. And there are many ways in which people took to the streets in a way that represented a great deal of courage in those times, especially the group called the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, um, spelled M-A-Y-O. And this plaza is the main public square in front of the presidential palace. So it's like the symbolic heart of the Argentine nation. Um, but there are also other ways in which activism was happening um, from within the Jewish community. So I'll just share some examples. Um, so I'm here, that, that yeah. language, when did they start? Did they start assembling there already under the dictatorship? Yes. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so um, they started assembling, and I'll talk more about the mothers as well. So they started assembling in April of 1977, which was the height of the dictatorship. Um, they stood together as mothers who were looking for their children who had disappeared. And at first they would go to police stations and other offices saying, I don't know where my child is, where my son or daughter is. And they were just told, oh, they must have just vanished. They must have just gone missing or disappeared. And because of that, they started talking to each other and building a community of other mothers. And the reason why it was women is not because men didn't care about their children being disappeared, but because to be a man in public space protesting meant that you would be instantly targeted. And to be a mother in public space, especially in their early years of their protests, protected them in a certain way because motherhood was considered sacred in certain ways there at first. So at first they were dismissed as just, so at first they were held sacred as mothers, then they were dismissed as las locas, the crazy women in the Plaza de Mayo who were just standing there trying to find something. Um, and then they were actually targeted by the military dictatorship once they started garnering international attention, which I will add happened um, in part because the World Cup took place in Argentina in 1978. So you suddenly had international journalists there who, and these women, these mothers were standing in this main public square every Thursday afternoon. Um, and what you see on their heads are these white head scarves, which are really simple things, pieces of cloth that were also supposed to resemble, like speak to this idea of diapers, of something that you would just, you know, use as part of your motherhood. And they would stitch the names of their children into that cloth along with the dates of their disappearance and that became their symbol. Oh, wow. So, you know, this is just a little bit about the mothers and I'll talk more about them. Um, and they were probably the most visible form of public protest during that time. And that's really important, especially because of how much fear there was to say anything in public. Um, and the kind of protest and activism that happened was not just from the mothers, and we'll talk more about them as well, um, but also through publications and other forms of dissent. So you have here an image from Nueva Presencia, New Presence, um, which was a, a newspaper that was published by um, Herman Schiller, um, who was an activist. And that was another very important um, way of resisting the dictatorship. And Emmanuel Kaan writes about um, this Jewish publication. Is that yes. A Jewish Schiller or just? Or, uh, just uh, yes, he's a Jewish Argentine. Yes. And he also helped co found an organization called the Jewish Movement for Human Rights that I'll be talking about. Um, in terms of publications as well, it's important to note the work of Jacobo Timmerman. Um, here it's in Spanish, Preso Sin Nombre, Salda Sin Numero, which means prisoner without a name, cell without a number. So this was published in 1981. Um, and this was one of the first accounts about what was happening in Argentina in the first person. And Timmerman was also a journalist and the editor of a paper called La Opinion. Um, and he was uh, dis disappeared and, and, and then tortured, but because he was such a well-known figure, people knew what happened to him, and he eventually was released and went into exile, and that's when he published this book, um, and this was, again, one of the first first-person accounts, and I'll just say, in those years of violence in Latin America, you also have Rigoberta Manchu from Guatemala publishing her account in the early 80s, so that sense of testimony being a really important way to stand up to authoritarian violence in Latin America was really important and also connects to the importance of testimony for Holocaust survivors, I would argue. Um, and so you have these accounts, um, these words, this language as a way to resist. Um, and then you also have activism um, in the form of protests. So I'm going to talk about the Jewish Movement for Human Rights, which was co-founded by Herman Schiller and also by Rabbi Marshall Meyer, who was a North American rabbi, who had a really profoundly important role in the Jewish community in Argentina. And so I'll just share a little bit about him. So, you know, he came 
to Argentina in the late 1950s. Um, and he, after a couple of years working in one temple, eventually founded um, a temple called Batel that essentially created um, conservative Judaism in Argentina, whereas before it didn't really exist as a movement. And um, not only was he important individually, he also founded the Rabbinical Seminary in Latin America, of Latin America, which is in Buenos Aires. And so, you know, that sense of his impact on Jewish religious life, it was very important in Argentina, but that's not where his impact ended. Um, he also was one of the very few Jewish voices at the time that publicly and vocally opposed the dictatorship, protected in part by the fact that he had American citizenship. So he was able to say things that local rabbis may not have been able to say in the same way. Um, and he also would later be part of the CONADEP, which was the truth commission that formed after the end of the dictatorship. And he helped create the Jewish movement for human rights. And you see him up here in the glasses with the microphone. Um, Still under the dictatorship, they were able to yes. be this and not be scared that there would be, I mean, it's, it's this was really so. This, yeah, this image is towards the end of the dictatorship, but again, you know, because of his own sense of ethics and justice, you know, he not only was doing things like this movement for Jewish human rights, um, he also in Beth El would, it, this it was known as a space where mothers and grandmothers who were looking for their children and grandchildren could talk to him. And so there are ways in which he was a really important voice especially at a time when the official Jewish community was afraid in many ways to stand up the, to the dictatorship in the way that we uh, might hope um, happens today more. Um, so, you know, these were groups, and, but, you know, but thinking about all of this, I want to focus on the experience of the mothers in particular and the role of Jewish mothers as part of this activism as well. Natasha, I just want to interrupt just for a second. I want to, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for mentioning Marshall Meyer, but also, and, and, and the students here should know, uh, a few years back, um, Hani Grossman, who now works oh, in recruiting, um, wrote a fabulous um, senior uh, thesis, uh, honors thesis, about the role of Marshall Meyer um, in, in this human rights struggle, yeah. uh, using his papers at, that are digitized at Duke. And, and, uh, and Dr. Zaretsky was, a, was an incredibly helpful resource to, to Hani and um, really helped her um, um, really create a, a wonderful thesis. And his, his role and his impact is, is so, has, you know, has ripple effects all over the Jewish world actually. Um, and and he's a fascinating, fascinating figure. Um, so there's a lot more, I think there's still a lot more to study about him and, and to uncover. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I wanted just to thank you for that. And, and yeah. Um, yeah. No, I agree. And I think, you know, it, even in interviews that I was doing in Argentina that had nothing, you know, to do with, with, with this, everyone would talk about Marshall Meyer and his impact on them and their memories of Batel and what it meant to, you know, feel a revitalization of what Jewishness could mean and Jewish practice in relation to their contemporary struggles in Argentina. Um, so, you know, so thinking about Marshall Meyer and this kind of activism, what it means to be publicly protesting also brings me back to the experience of the mothers and what it meant to really, you know, stand there, you know, without any political experience, you know, all your, it was the, one of the most basic things that a person can do as a mother looking for her child. Um, and, you know, they would stand there, they would have photographs of their children. And all this was about resisting this idea that they just vanished into thin air and never existed perhaps in the first place. And so they were resisting that. And they continue to be there every Thursday afternoon. And I'll just say that, you know, even as I talk about the experiences of some of the Jewish mothers in particular, um, I'll just say that their activism wasn't just important during the dictatorship. So the dictatorship ended in 1983, um, not just because of the activism of human rights groups like the mothers, but also because Argentina lost in the Falkland Islands, where like there were other fat historical factors that went into the end of the dictatorship. But this movement was really important as part of what helped and that dictatorship, but even after it ended, they continued meeting every Thursday afternoon in the Plaza de Mayo because of how important that activism was to holding on to democracy in Argentina and their activism continued for decades. They were standing there every Thursday afternoon, 
up until COVID, which then made it impossible for people to publicly gather. Um, so, and then everything went online and virtual the way many of our worlds have gone online and virtual. And so that sense of how their activism and Jewish activism during that time was important, not just for that time, but also ongoing throughout the democracy. Um, I just want to highlight here, as I talk about the specifically Jewish dimensions of what this time meant for the mothers who were survivors of the Holocaust and also lost children during this time. Um, so, uh, and this is an image more recently of the mothers in that Plaza de Maja. Um, so I'm going to talk about the story of one woman in particular who stands out. Um, her name is Sara Rus, um, and she was a member of the Mothers of the Plaza de Maja founding line. And so I'll just also say as a side note that the group split into two groups. Um, th this is natural for social movements as they have different political goals and other issues going on, but she was part of the founding line. So Sara Rus was born in Ludz, Poland. Um, she is a survivor. She first, in the, the earlier part of the war, she survived the Ludz ghetto and later the Auschwitz-Birkenau and Mauthausen concentration camps. And she came to Argentina in 1948, which again was that time when there was a ban on Jewish immigration. So it had to have been with falsified papers. And then she built a life in Argentina. Um, so she came in 1948, 1977, her son, Daniel, was disappeared. So, um, and here she is holding a picture of him. Um, so Daniel was taken when he was at work as a scientist at Argentina's Atomic Energy Commission. And before his disappearance, Sara and her husband Bernardo knew um, that friends and colleagues were being targeted. So they had actually urged their son to leave the country to go to Uruguay, but he had refused. Um, and then he was disappeared. And from the moment he disappeared, they searched everywhere, she said, appealing to the interior ministry and various government and international entities, all to no avail. And so she started to um, advocate for his return or for some kind of justice um, as one of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. And you see her with the white headscarf there. And then she continued after the end of the dictatorship, giving her testimony at schools and traveling to share her experience as someone um, who, as she put it, survived twice, survived both the Holocaust and then had to survive what happened to her son. Um, and after the Holocaust, she came to Argentina and she said that she believed that her family were trying to find a better world and a free world. And, you know, for her, the shock was to find that um, here she had come to a country um, in a world ruled by military that tortured and killed people in the same way as the Nazis, she said, and she felt that this could never be forgotten. Um, so for her, there was the shock of what was happening. Um, and then this conviction to find a way that this not be forgotten, because the kind of Forgetting and silence and denial is also part of the logics of genocide and violence that it seems as if nothing is happening on the surface, even though these horrible things might be happening to people behind closed doors. And so one of the ways in which Sara Rus and others try to find a way forward after the dictatorship was by telling their story. Um, and memory and testimonies became a really important part of the democracy in Argentina. So after the dictatorship ended in 1983, there was a truth commission called the CONADEP, um, the National Commission on Disappeared Persons, um, which was one of the very first truth commissions in the world. It preceded the South Africa Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission by several years. And they published a report called Nunca Mas, Never Again. And this idea was by collecting these stories from survivors and family members of victims to systematically account for what happened and chronicle it, society could never forget what happened. And it would be there and hold on to those memories and experiences until justice was possible. And that's part of also what people call transitional justice, this idea of how do you create these mechanisms and processes for society to find a way forward when uh, traditional retributive justice may not be possible. Um, so, you know, here you have this book that was published. It became a bestseller. So people were reading it. And this was a time when survivors were telling their story. Rabbi Marshall Meyer served on this commission, so this was very important, another important way he had an impact. So you also had in 1985 the trial of the juntas, which were, you know, top military leaders responsible for what happened. It was a military trial, not a civilian trial, but it was still really important. So there was a sense of momentum of finally justice happening, people being held accountable, um, the dictatorship is over, there's democracy, there's truth, 
And then there were amnesty laws. So everyone convicted in this trial was forgiven. Um, and there were amnesty laws that prevented perpetrators from being prosecuted. And so this was in the late 1980s. So suddenly you go into a time when there's impunity, which means no punishment, which means no accountability, which means you're walking down the street and might pass by the person who tortured your family member. And that was the reality in the 1990s that made it so important for the activists to continue their work. Um, and this continued week after week, month after month with various protests and activism from both Jewish activists and non-Jewish activists, but Jewish activists were an important part of this. Um, and so what you see here is one of these mass protests that happened on March 24th, um, which is the day that the coup um, happened in Argentina and is now called the National Day of Remembrance, Truth and Justice. And this was from just two years ago, so obviously pre-COVID. Um, and what you see here is a banner with all the faces of those who were disappeared. And this is just one of the many ways in which memory has become a really important part of Argentine society and democracy there. But also, um, it's important to look back to, um, to, to see the way that it had other kinds of impacts. It wasn't just through commemorations, but also through trials. So the amnesty laws were overturned in 2005, so human rights trials could begin again. Um, and many of the women and, and men as well who had survived the dictatorship or who had family members who were persecuted were able to give their testimony. So here you see Sara Rus again giving her testimony in 2013 at the ESMA Megatron trial and ESMA stands for the School of Naval Mechanics in Argentina, where much of the torture took place. Um, so, and this is also where Vera's daughter was detained and from where she was then taken for the death flight. So here you see this image from a Jewish Argentine artist, Eugenia Becaris, who illustrated uh, what she was witnessing there, Sara Rus giving her testimony. Um, and this is for a project called Dibujos Urgentes, Urgent Drawings. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's important here is how someone like Sara and all the other Jewish activists, um, how they continue to tell their stories in courts and in schools and in other spaces because of something else that Vera Haraj actually said to Angela Merkel here, which was um, that along with memory, justice, and truth, which are these pillars of human rights in Argentina, you also, it's also important um, to stand up to silence. Um, and she said that her fourth appeal to humanity, along with memory, justice, and truth, is never again for there to be silence. Um, so that's where this moment takes us. Um, and if there's time, I wanted to share a little bit about how this connects to the Amia bombing as well, just to give a sense of why this Jewish activism was so important. As we transition there, um, if there are questions, send them into the chat. Well, we do have, we have, we have a full 15 minutes more. We have 20 minutes. So, okay. so we'll have time. We'll have time. If you can, you know, so we'll definitely have time. But if you have questions, please send them into the chat. This is so powerful, so powerful and so relevant, sadly, still. It's a... Uh, um, Thank you. Um, and, I, and I think that that question of how, you know, even though this seems to be happening really far away from wherever you may be in New York or wherever you're zooming in from, um, that, you know, these questions of what it actually means to survive and to, to find a place for this historical memory in contemporary struggles for justice and what it means to be a citizen and a member of the world and what, what this means for the kind of hope that people can have for the future to speak to the series itself, Crisis and Hope. Um, so going the back- question, there are two there, There's a question that, yeah. that may, be, may be like relevant right now. Sure. Um, one was from Mark, how many, how many prosecuted after amnesty was eliminated? Um, what, were there any prosecutions after amnesty? I mean, did it, did it really protect everyone? So yes, yeah, so after so so the only cases had to do with the grandchildren um, that were those were the only cases that were happening in the 1990s. But it was really after the amnesty laws were overturned um, in the early 2000s. As of 2005 is when the human rights trials really began. And so since then, there have been over 100 such human rights trials and many, many convictions of different kinds, including in the mega ESMA trial, which took place from 2012 to 2017, which looked at the range of different human rights abuses that took place at the ESMA, where there were 
5,000 victims in that concentration camp alone. Um, and there were such camps all over Argentina. And so, you know, the this is really a wave of justice over the last 15 years. Um, but it's part of it's it's as a result of the kind of activism that was happening even during that period of the 1990s when there was this extreme um, impunity that was going on. And I see another Another question about the role of the USA government supporting the regimes of Argentina and Guatemala. This is another really important question. Um, I actually uh, have, have written about this. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, the U.S. had a very different role in Argentina than it had in Guatemala or Chile, although it was related because it was part of the Cold War strategy in the Western Hemisphere, um, which had to do with the national security doctrine, um, which dictated that communism should be prevented from spreading in any way possible in the Western Hemisphere. And anyone who was considered subversive was subversive related to those ideas. And so in Argentina in particular, the US was not directly involved. However, they many of um, the military who, was, who were in power and who were the perpetrators were trained at the School of the Americas. Um, and they had the approval um, of Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State in the early years, um, who knew what was happening. And there are declassified government documents in the US that chronicle these conversations and exchanges between you know, the military in power and Kissinger. Um, so you know, this is all in the historical record. However, um, when Jimmy Carter became president, things changed. And then there was more advocacy for human human rights and really holding Argentina's feet more to the fire in terms of what was happening from the Carter administration. So there was definitely a change um, that happened there. Um, so, it's, so it's a complicated history in relation to the role of the US government. Um, but that's why it is important to look at these declassified documents and why history is so important to all of this and thinking about what's in the archival record and why the testimonies of those who live through these experiences, especially when looked at collectively and you see the patterns that emerge among many people telling their stories um, as also connected to forensic anthropology and the kind of evidence that exists in other ways is so important to establishing a way forward. And we see in Argentina, even though the Truth Commission took place in 1984, for, um, many of the testimonies from that time were important to them building a case in 2012 um, that was then able to be pursued. So thinking about the historical futures of justice is also really vital. And I'll say that even though in some ways what happened with human rights in Argentina and the fact that there are all these trials is so um, inspiring in many ways, um, the terrain of justice is uneven in Argentina. And I'll say that it is very much the case in relation to the AMIA bombing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the bombing itself for those who may not be familiar. The AMIA stands for um, Asociación Mutual Israelita Argentina, which is usually translated as the Argentine Jewish Mutual Aid Society. And this was a community center. It started as a burial society, actually, but then it also grew to be a community center where people went for events, for cultural activities, to look for a job. Um, it was very much like a JCC. It was a place that was part of people's every everyday lives. And in the 1990s, when there was this time of impunity, you had two bombings take place, actually. In 1992, the Israeli embassy was attacked um, and people were killed. Um, but that was considered not necessarily the responsibility of the Argentine government because it was attack on the representation of the state of Israel. Um, but this community center, the Argentine Jewish Mutual Aid Society, that was an Argentine community center. And it was one of many mutual aid societies that immigrants to Argentina created. There were Italian mutual aid societies and Spanish mutual aid societies. You know, Jews were part of this fabric of European immigration to Argentina as well. And so when this bombing happened in 1994, and you see an image of it here, um, the building was destroyed. This was a building that also housed other organizations like the Daya um, and also the YIVO. So the Yiddish Community Archives were also um, partially destroyed through this attack. 85 people were killed and hundreds were wounded. Um, and this was one of the worst terrorist attacks, if not the, the worst in Argentina's history, and one of the worst anti-Semitic terrorist attacks in the Western Hemisphere. 
And in the days afterwards, you can imagine that there was a lot of fear, a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos. And the Jewish community in particular was wondering, you know, it felt like we were attacked in 1992, we're being attacked again in 1994. How can we find a way forward to feel safe? And what does this mean? Um, and so in the days immediately afterwards, you know, you had signs of solidarity on the one hand. So this is from just three days after the bombing, you had this massive protests um, in the Plaza de los Dos Congresos, which is in the center of, our, of Buenos Aires. And you see the sign that says, todos somos, hoy todos somos judíos, today we're all Jews, like that sense of solidarity, like we're all standing with you. So that was on the one hand. Um, but on the other hand, you had newscasters saying that so and so many um, Jews were killed and so and so many innocent people were killed. Um, so there's this sudden difference that was established in the public sphere. You had the president of, the Ar of Argentina at the time, Carlos Menem, um, who called our Israel to give his condolences and was told, well, this happened to the Jewish community in Argentina and not to an Israeli institution. So I don't know why you're calling Israel. And so many Jewish Argentines felt like this question their belonging in Argentina. And so along with this issue of finding justice for what happened and finding out who was responsible and holding them accountable, there was also this question of, do I really belong in Argentina? And is there a safe place for me? And can there be a safe place if there is no justice, if there is no rule of law? And it turns out that the investigation was very corrupt. There are many allegations of the role of the Argentine state in the problematic investigation, as well as potentially in the actual attack in relation to looking away from various factors. So I'm not going to go into who was responsible, how they're responsible, because it's still a question that's after 25 years, people are asking. Um, there were two failed trials in Argentina and uh, one um, in the early 2000s and one that concluded in 2019. And the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has proclaimed that Argentina has failed to provide justice in this case. So, you know, this is this ongoing wound in the Jewish community. Um, and in response, you know, what was interesting to me as an anthropologist is what do you do with this lack of justice, especially when it comes to your own children or family members being killed? And so what's interesting is that um, the Jewish community turned to many of the same strategies that the mothers of the Place de Major used in terms of using the images of their loved ones and having regularly occurring protests. So this is from one of the main annual protests when you see the word justicia, justice being held up. Um, but you also see this in other public spaces. So, you know, this is in front of the high courts of Argentina. Um, and this is one of the, this is on the 20th anniversary of the bombing. So this is from, um, this is this is from more recently, but um, this group, Memoria Activa, Active Memory, would gather here in front of the high courts every Monday morning, which is the day and time that the bombing happened. And um, what was important about their work to me as an anthropologist was that it wasn't just that they stood there demanding justice, which was important enough. Um, it's that they would begin every Monday morning um, by blowing the shofar in this public space in front of the high courts to demand everybody to stop what they were doing and to listen. And it was this call for justice that was very much bound up with their own sense of ethics as both Jews and Argentines. Um, so that presence in the public sphere was really important for them as citizens. And that was part of the legacy of the protests from the dictatorship and the ways in which Jews were able to be part of these activist movements, both the mothers of the Place de Majo, as well as in the specifically Jewish movements like the Jewish Movement for Human Rights. And this became an important way for them to continue advocating for justice. Um, and I'll just say, you know, in um, as like final thoughts on this before we turn to questions, um, you know, for many of the people I've worked with, it's been years now of trying to find some kind of justice. In the case of dictatorship era crimes, there have been important advances, as I've said, over 100 trials, including the recently concluded ESMA mega trial. Um, but in the case of the AMIA bombing, it still remains unsolved 25 years later. And what emerges then for many people is even if, <clears throat> even if they find some kind of justice through the courts, like the human rights trials related to the dictatorship, 
their family members are still gone. And in the case of the Amia, for instance, which ha there has been no justice, that sense of justice is like perpetually hovering on the horizon. Every year, I've been going to Argentina since 2001. So it's been 20 years um, of me witnessing their efforts for justice. And it's always right there. And yet, despite the fact that it may never come, they continue advocating, they continue standing there. So their activism has become more than just about um, finding the justice. Um, what I found in my own work is that I call it this act of repair, um, which is also the title of my book, because that sense of how does this create possibilities for agency, even when there may never be justice or any kind of closure for them and how important this is to their own sense of who they are as human beings and who they are as Jewish Argentines. Um, and I'm just going to end um, with the words of someone else who I work with very closely, who's a Holocaust survivor named Jack Fuchs. Um, oh, and I'll just say here of why this matters. Um, before turning to Jack's words. So you have someone like Sofia Guterman who lost her only daughter in the Amia bombing. And for her, the reason why memory matters so much is because she says that if people don't remember her daughter, it will be as if she had died twice. And so her activism continues to matter in that way. And then you have Vera Haric, whose daughter was disappeared and killed decades ago and continues to advocate because she feels like never again can there be silence and this takes me back to why it's so important to think about these questions of memory in relation to what it really means to survive and to live after having gone through something like the dictatorship or the Amia bombing or the Holocaust. And I'll just turn um, as my final thought to the words of, um, of Jack Fuchs, um, who is from Ludge, Poland and who survived Auschwitz and then came to Argentina. And, you know, in our interview, he said, you know, people don't know what they're capable of surviving, how much pain and how much suffering a person can go through. Um, and then he says, you know, often wondering, is it possible to live again and to feel again? And that question of what it really means to live again and to feel again was at the heart of what brought me to Argentina and to thinking about how this community who's survived so much can find a way forward again. And then Jack said, Apparently it is, you know, because there he is still living and still feeling. Um, and so even though we're sitting in his Buenos Aires apartment, a high rise overlooking a park, a beautiful place, you know, in a beautiful city, you know, that memory of what happened to him is still very much present. And yet, you know, he's found a way forward. And so what it means to feel again and live again in Argentina, knowing that justice may never come in many cases. Um, in those cases, memory remains really vital and their efforts go towards memory in different forms of all these activists through commemorations, through events at schools, through writing, and as Vera Haric said, so that there is never again silence. Um, and so to think back to the question of how you can create meaning after tragedy, this demand for memory is a part of that. And it goes along with the, these questions of justice and truth um, and what connects both their Jewish and Argentine dimensions of their experience as they build these personal and collective acts of repair together. Um, um, so that's where I will end my part of the talk, and I welcome any questions you have um, and what time remains. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zaretsky. Um, wow, we've seen so much here. Um, if you can send questions to chat or you can just unmute yourself. Um, it, it, you know, it's amazing these two, these two tragedies, right? And they, they coexist, as you point out, within a community that's incredibly vibrant. Uh, even with a lot of people who moved away over the years, there's terrible financial crises that, that afflict uh, Argentina periodically. Um, but this is a community that produces amazing Jewish films and Jewish music and Jewish literature and, 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 Jew and, and, and religious culture. Um, and it's just, so it's, you know, it's, it's part of the, um, the complexity of, of these, of these terrible events is that they're happening within the context of a very, a very, um, you know, vibrant, energetic uh, community. Um, um, there, are, people have questions they want to ask. I want, I have some other questions, but I want to leave the space open for other people. Um, 
how did you start getting interested in this? You mentioned it a little bit, but can you explain a little bit how you got into this? Yeah, so I in anthropology, our method is field work, which includes participant observation and in-depth interviews. So it means, you know, trying to participate in and observe what people do in their lives, in their daily lives and in their practices, and also talking to them, interviewing them. Um, and I was interested in Argentina because it was a place that had all these different strands of history coming together. So, you know, you had a very large um, Jewish community there, um, and I was interested in the Jewish diaspora in the Americas, and it also had this history related to human rights. And when I first arrived in Argentina in 2001, it was still before the amnesty laws were overturned, and it was still at a time um, when the AMIA bombing had just happened in 1994, so it was only seven years from the time that the bombing happened. And I was really struck by the way that these activists continued every Monday morning in the case of the AMIA bombing, you know, or every Thursday afternoon in the case of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, they continued to stand there week after week after week. And um, it just inspired me to really think about, you know, how these new forms of memory practices and collective practices can be an important way forward when there might never be a resolution to their trauma or a resolution in the case of trying to find justice. And, you know, for many of the people that I interviewed, it seemed as if I would ask them, do you believe that justice will happen in Argentina? And they said, no. And so I said, well, then why are you still standing here week after week asking for justice if it seems as if it may never be possible? And they found another kind of meaning for themselves through that act of standing there. It was important for their agency. And as someone else I interviewed, uh, Rebecca Sokolsky said, you know, that very act of being able to demand justice is what made her feel human. And so that sense of being able to ask for justice and demand it, and that's how people understood their humanity um, and their subjectivity, that's what was interesting to me about Argentina and that continued to unfold over my time there. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, that's one of the paradoxes right here that especially after the, the amnesty law, where you can have truth, but then there's no enforcement of justice, but maybe that's still justice, right? Maybe that that is a different model that could be useful in other, other parts of the world. I mean, in South Africa, they decide not to pro prosecute people, right? I, if I understood what happened there, uh, but they did decide to have a full accounting as much as they could. Um, Right, and so I think every every with these mass political crimes, right, where there, there's an entire population that's terrorized, what do you do with that? I mean, how you right. you, you can never get everyone, right? Um, yeah. Right. And it doesn't come without its issues as well, because, you know, there are many who argue that, you know, a truth commission on its own is not enough, that there has to be some kind of legal accounting as well. Um, so it's not without its faults or limitations. But I think as an anthropologist, let's say socially for the people on the ground, it matters for them to be able to tell their story and have their voices heard. It also matters for them to have the perpetrators held accountable. So yeah. it's a complicated thing. There's a question here about how many were Jews among those who were disappeared. If it's estimated to be 12% of that number. And again, these are still estimates because, you know, there hasn't been able to be a full accounting um, because of the way in which the evidence and the traces were, were, were how the government tried to disappear those, those very traces of that evidence. So a lot of this is building this back together through people's accounts and through the work of the forensic anthropology team in Argentina, um, but it's estimated to be 12%, um, which again is a large number considering that they are 1% of the population. Right, and, and also something, I mean, you, you, you alluded to this, but something that a lot of the people who write about that the, the, this chapter, point out is that they were, when they were in these camps, when they were being tortured, they were often um, subjected to tremendous anti-Semitic abuse, right? That it was kind of like a signaling out of the Jews um, in a very particular way. And that the junta tapped into a lot of the aesthetics and a lot of the, certainly the ideology of the Nazis. So it's not as though they're like, you know, it really is kind of a, a re, re, um, uh, Reinstantiation of the horrors of Nazism and the and the ideas behind it, 
albeit in a much smaller, um, less less devastating, you know, package. But um, it's a, right. It's and how, I, how ideas don't die, right? They, right. They come back. They 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 look different, and so it's hard to say. Oh, you can't call it that. You can't call it that. But how ideas have this life force in them um, for good and for bad, and and how they transform. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the other things that's important there is why, you know, Vera Harash, for example, was speaking to Angela Merkel, German chancellor, and saying that, you know, there's no grave for her grandfather who was killed in Auschwitz, and there's also no grave for her daughter who was killed in Argentina. And, you know, that sense of why, you know, she thinks that denial and silence is such an important thing to resist because of how that feeds into and allows for these kinds of violence to take place because you know in Argentina there was a coup but as we know in Europe you know this isn't something that happened overnight you know this was a process that had to do precisely with what you were saying about the ideas and so the question of like what is the idea of justice and the idea of truth that's important to a democratic society that's also at the heart of this activism yes and I want to conclude on that note. And I want to um, want to commend our students at, at, at Yeshiva University um, have been at the forefront of, of advocating for bringing attention to the, the, the plight of the Uyghurs in China, the Muslim Uyghurs who are being um, going through tremendous, tremendous horrors. Um, and it leaves us with, you know, you look at what happened in Argentina and you say, you know, what can you do? What can any individual do in the face of such violence and impunity and and it's a very hard question it's left but um i'll um i'll leave on a moment of hope and hope that that this generation will it won't solve the problems but will know how to at least attack them and uh, bring light to them and and i and through through studying the past i hope that that gives you all tools to do that um and i'm excited to see where that takes us and, and to, towards a better, a better world, a more humane world, a more interconnected world. Um, and Dr. Zretsky, it really has been a pleasure to have you here and I hope you come back. And, um, and to my students, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, journey this semester. I'm excited to see your, your, um, your papers and to discuss them further, um, to go deeper. And uh, I look forward to see, seeing those of you who aren't graduating, um, congratulations, but those who aren't, I hope to see you on campus in the fall. Um, and I really, really look forward to that. Um, so thank you so much for coming, for joining and for our, our, our guests. Um, I really thank you for joining as well. And uh, the recordings for this and all the other um, Latin American, Jewish Latin American series will be available um, soon. And, and I wanna just uh, thank our sponsors the Center for Israel Studies, the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Center for International Affairs, the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies, and Madei Hayadut, um, Jewish Judaic Studies at what, Yeshiva University, and Shalom from Yeshiva University. And uh, really thank you so much again. Thank you. All right, everybody.